Kia ora tato. It's really exciting to be here to open day two of an event such as this focused on enabling digital identity and privacy in a connected world. It's a really big topic. You've been hearing about this over the last day. In many ways, it's a scary one, and I applaud Miriam and her team and the conference partners for being bold enough to continue to open up this topic for learning, discussion, and I'm picking some pretty robust debate. But before I look into the enabling part of the conference title, I'd like to explore the why. Why, are we, why am I interested professionally in this? Why is it important that we can safely integrate and share data? I haven't put these up to shock or depress you, but I thought it was worth opening with this as a contextual starter. Um, I know that the Minister of uh, Finance <coughs> mentioned vulnerable children yesterday. For me, this is a key reason why we're interested in integrating and sharing data. Um, it shouldn't come as, you, as a surprise to you that given my role, I'm interested in how we can understand and solve deep-seated problems like the ones you see on the screen, unlock opportunities, or simply tell the story of who we have been, are, uh, and becoming as a nation. Data and technology we have available to us now can provide us with new insights into these complex problems. And my point is that uh, the connected world we now live in needs to be harnessed safely to achieve this. Another way of looking at value is to look at it from a dollar figure perspective. Uh, the Data Driven Innovation Report released just recently in April um, has quantified the gains from data innovation to be $2.4 billion for New Zealand. The report highlights that potential gains to be had, however, are in fact in the region of $4.8 billion. This is $2.7 billion in value, both in terms of economic and social sectors. For example, increased productivity in the transport and logistics sector through efficiencies and reduced costs, or greater yields in the dairy sector, or huge potential gains in value for the social sector. The Productivity Commission too has been looking into this and has noted the need to leverage data and information to improve social services. They highlight the way that data can be, improved to, uh, can be used to improve the sector's performance, most notably, as the Minister has just mentioned, around service de delivery and the ability of clients and families to have greater influence in the way that services are packaged. In fact, the figures that I had on the last slide which I've quoted from the Salvation Army, the 2015 State of the Nation report, are another example of data added value through analytics. The report reuses data collected by Statistics New Zealand through surveys like the Household Economic Survey. Whichever way you look at it, any discussion about the connected world, the intrinsic and the potential value and balance points regarding identity and privacy have to start with value. The potential to innovate, cut costs, deliver better value to customers across every sector must be at the heart of this discussion. Value needs to be the linchpin, the litmus test and the driving logic behind the goal to harness data for economic, social and environmental good. And we've only just started to understand the possibilities. In terms of creating value, it has to be said we've got a great deal of catching up to do um, if you compare the value that we get from data to other countries around the world. But deriving data from, value from data is at Statistics New Zealand our raison d'etre, and we believe we're starting to make good progress. But there is no doubt that we're in uncharted territory, as you've heard from previous speakers. The pace of change, the de degree of connection, means that the way that we enable digital identity and privacy needs needs to be able to adapt to data uses that we haven't even thought of. The way that we enable digital identity and privacy also needs to be sufficiently flexible to allow for individual preference and control. This slide that I've put up is, um, the top of it is from Cisco, um, 2011. Um, the bottom quote is also from Cisco, where they've now realized that uh, their init initial um, guesstimate at 50 billion in terms of connected devices is more likely to be 75, and I'm assuming that before we get there, they will have revised that again. 
So if you think about those connected devices um, and you think about individual preference, um, as many people, uh, people over the last day have, have mentioned, um, I may wish to share my fitness information with a fitness program or even my doctor, but I not, may not be particularly keen about it being shared with my insurance company. I may be, feel perfectly happy about wearing a Disney band on my wrist, wrist in order to gain access to rides, prizes and special deals, but feel uncomfortable about wearing a similar band in other parts of my life where that data could be shared. Um, one person may feel perfectly happy to have a single me medical record that is shared between the hospital, doctor, pharmacy, physio, because it means that if they turn up in a and e, at A&E, they'll know how to treat them. Another person may see this as absolutely intrusive. The fact is that we need to find a way in which we can deal with these both huge potential benefits for individuals community and communities and huge potential risks if the information is misused. And while regulation will remain important, it won't be sufficient. We need to develop principles, guidance and mechanisms that allow the benefits of data to be harnessed safely. Now, the Minister's already referred to the New Zealand Data Futures Forum. Um, it spent the last year exploring what New Zealand needs to create a data ecosystem based on high trust and high value. And on the screen behind me are some of the discussion documents that the forum published last year, and if you haven't looked already, I encourage you to take a look. So how can New Zealand avoid being left behind in terms of the value that we need to create? Or as the forum chair, John Whitehead, so aptly put it, get caught like a possum in the headlights? The Americans and New Zealand's own data forum have essentially landed in the same place in terms of the way forward. I think the forum sets out some realistic and achievable ways that this can be embedded into data collection, use and sharing practices. Building privacy and security into data frameworks and the full data life cycle is key. So are accountability, transparency and openness about what data is held, how it is managed, and most importantly, how it's used. Now, I'm aware that for those of you who went to some of the sessions yesterday, um, you will have already seen this. Um, we are in uncharted territories, and, and for that uh, reason, a compass is important. And these four principles that were developed by the Data Futures Forum uh, are proposed to safely manage and optimise data use in New Zealand and help us na navigate the future of data. The principles are value, trust, inclusion and control are intended to guide solution development and ensure that we can achieve the best outcomes in terms of harnessing the benefits and maintaining trust and importantly protection. As you will know, data initiatives and solutions are developed in a complex and fast moving world and as such regulation will not always be able to keep up. So having principles like these to enable us to make choices uh, are going to be incredibly important. These principles have formed the foundation for the work that Stats New Zealand has been leading to progress the forum's thinking into doing, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Yesterday, I think um, Malcolm um, also mentioned the data quadrant, um, scenario use quadrant that the uh, Data Futures Forum had developed. I, like Malcolm, see this as being an incredibly useful tool and heuristic for us to, um, to use in the context of making decisions about, about data. So basically what they've developed is a data use scenario quadrant, and it's on the screen behind me as you can see, to emphasise how privacy is context specific and how different data solutions, use solutions, require different rules of the game. Factors such as the type of data being used, the potential for identification, misuse and the value that can be gained through its use all need to be understood, measured and assessed before an informed decision can be made whether it's in the public's interest to proceed. Quadrants three and four cover the use of anonymised or non-personal data. Quadrant two covers situations where the individual has the right to decide where the data that identifies them can be linked, shared and used to target interventions. 
And Quadrant 1 covers situations where an agency or agencies have the right to decide whether data that identifies an individual can be linked, shared or used to target interventions uh, from a collective public good perspective. So you can imagine here you're talking about uh, um, hospitals um, identifying the potential for uh, child abuse and um, those sorts of situations. The Data Futures Forum argued that organisations should <coughs> minimise the mandatory use of identifiable personal information and wherever possible, move to an arrangement where individuals have more say over the use of personal data or, or one to where data is anonymised and used in a non-personal way. So effectively what they're saying is that we should minimise the amount of data that's being held here and, and seek to move into these quadrants. Interestingly, the, the Productivity Commission's recently released report on the on social sector also uses this quadrant, picks it up, and the principles that the um, Data Futures Forum have um, developed, and talk very much about shifting more into this space in terms of individual decisions um, around uh, services. Now I'd like to show you an example of how using this quadrant can work in practice uh, with an example that work, fits perfectly into the third quadrant. In 2012, we created the integrated <coughs> data infrastructure, an anonymised, linked, longitudinal data set and extended it in 2013, and it now contains a substantial amount of data. An overview of this is playing on the screen behind me. The IDI, contains data on education, benefits, tax, families and households, health and safety, justice, migration, student loans and allowances and business data, as well as a number of Statistics New Zealand survey databases, data sets. By integrating data collected across government, we create a data set that is changing the landscape when it comes to providing data for evidence-based policy, evaluation and research. As you heard from the Minister earlier, people do not exist in silos. We need to make sure that we are providing services that meet their needs, and a data set such as this provides greater explanatory power about people's uh, uh, journeys and the outcomes of those. So how is the IDI being used? The Ministry of Education have used the IDI to produce their Moving On Up report. Using the IDI data, they report on employment outcomes, earnings and destination of graduates one, two and five years after study. This information was then picked up and made accessible to students through the Careers New Zealand website, where prospective students contemplating what study can compare options and outcomes. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment used the IDI to examine the impact of temporary migrants, including international students, on the New Zealand labour market, and whether temporary migrants have a negative effect on the employment opportunities available to New Zealanders. Their report showed that the employment of temporary migrants has no negative effect on wages and employment of existing workers in New Zealand, and following the release of this report, policy was changed to relax the working rights of international students, allowing them to undertake more hours of employment while studying in New Zealand. The IDI has also been used to understand how successful New Zealanders in retaining qualifications, examining the overseas migration patterns of New Zealand's domestic tertiary graduates. Their uh, MB's Who Left, Who Returned and Who Was Still Away report showed about a quarter of graduates left New Zealand for a year or more, about a quarter of those who went overseas returned to New Zealand within four years. The more highly qualified graduates were, the more likely they left New Zealand and were still overseas seven years after finishing their qualifications. The graduates aged 20 to 24 were more likely than any other age group to be still overseas seven years later. Treasury is using the IDI to deliver 
system-wide views of the drivers of poor social, economic and fiscal outcomes, and is looking to identify high return on investment opportunities across the system. And the Productivity Commission, in partnership with Motu, are using the longitudinal business data in the IDI to better understand productivity and the role of policy in improving it. And as we speak, there are also other researchers looking at the IDI, uh, looking at issues to do with vulnerable children, for example. As I said before, Statistics New Zealand takes its stewardship role very seriously and no less so with, than with the IDI. Now, I wouldn't surprise me if in this room there may be a number of you who might be thinking if only I had access to a data set like this, I'd be able to do amazing policy evaluation and research. So let me talk about how we manage safe access and use of the IDI. Access to data like this is managed by our microdata access team and the IDI is available to only approved researchers. In order to gain approval, so that goes to, uh, to the, the, the famous five or what we describe as our five safes. In order to gain approval, uh, we, have, we focus on safe people. So researchers must show that their project, they must be bona, bona fide researchers. Um, they must also be able to show that their project is only for bona fide research or for statistical purposes. Um, it cannot be used to identify individuals. It can be used to develop risk profiles um, for groups um, in order to better understand what works and what doesn't, but it cannot be used to identify individuals. The research must be in the public interest, um, and we always check to make sure that the proposed research is, is unlikely to risk breaching any confidentiality. So in terms of those five safe, safe people, in terms of the research that's undertaking the work, safe projects, um, that they are in fact uh, focused on public good, um, safe settings, the, um, the work um, is through our data labs or remote labs, that the data is safe, that is, it is anonymised, and then in terms of the output of the, um, the research, that before it actually goes out of our data labs, it is confidentialised in a way which makes sure that, uh, uh, that it is safe. We're extremely proud of what we've achieved with the IDI, but as I indicated earlier, the IDI is simply one, um, albeit a very rich and well-managed data set, and New Zealand is just one player in the wider eco data ecosystem. My point is that uh, we need to look much wider than Statistics New Zealand and we need to look back again now at the, at the wider ecosystem. The proliferation of information through technology as people continuously emit only increases the chances of use or misuse and we need to think seriously about this. John Edwards, the Privacy Commissioner, has called the IDI a grand bargain and this is highly relevant to the discussion we're having today. Now and in the years to come, we will all need to shape the balance between value and privacy risks. This is because, as I pointed out earlier, data about individuals will proliferate in ways we're unlikely to be able to prevent. And privacy in this context needs to recognise that data that is held about individuals across this, the ecosystem is still largely unknown and unquantifiable and expanding rapidly. Which brings me to the subject of social licence. Social licence is a term originally coined by mining companies in relation to a local community's acceptance or approval for a project or ongoing presence in an area. An interesting confluence of concepts when you consider the fact that data is often referred to as the new oil. The New Zealand Data Forum has given extensive consideration to this topic and has framed its thinking under the banner use of data and information that is acceptable to New Zealanders. But you can't accept something you don't understand or worse, even don't even know about. Social licence in the context of data has to be broader than simply acceptance or permission. Ultimately, it is individual behaviours and practices that will create the data ecosystem we need to take us into the future. We need to create a world where individuals would no more misuse private information than they would now smoke at their desks. 
We've recently undertaken public attitudinal research to find out how individuals feel about the information being used and what their understanding is about what the information is being used for. Early indications are showing that people are primarily concerned about who gets access and for what purposes. The findings will enable to us to make the right choices so that Statistics New Zealand upholds our reputation as a trusted steward and provider of data to enable decisions. But I think it's fair to say that we're all guilty of having shied away from a meaningful discussion with the public about data use, and why. Because more often than not, the debate is constantly framed around privacy failures, not data opportunities or success stories. On the screen behind me are just a handful of headlines from the past 12 months. Now, I see opportunity here. I see the opportunity to educate the public on their rights, enabling true informed consent. The opportunity to facilitate use across all sectors, in particular Māori. The opportunity to encourage the next generation data and therefore privacy savvy individuals. So how can we achieve that social license? We need to promote the value, and we can all do this. But who needs to take the responsibility? My agency certainly, and we're working on this now, but ultimately everyone has a stake in this, and, I, and doing this effectively requires an aligned and co-designed approach. I'm not saying tread carefully, I'm saying we need to tread together and take a coordinated and integrated approach to the broader issue of social license and ultimately a conversation with the public. The Data Futures Forum, as one of their recommendations, recommended the establishment of a data council, which the forum suggested could take the lead on raising broader public awareness and capability. As I mentioned earlier, the Statistics New Zealand has been leading the work on how government might implement the Data Futures Forum's recommendations. And one of the things we've been doing is to unpack and refine the idea of a data council. We've been doing this by talking with a cross-section of individuals and organisations representative of a wide range of sectors. And as we've talked, it's become clear that we're talking about a partnership based on the four principles of value, inclusion, trust, and control. Watch this space. I think this will be our opportunity to collectively create a truly inclusive data ecosystem for New Zealand in which New Zealanders, New Zealanders are empowered to manage their own digital identity, enabled to use data, and are enthusiastic about the potential of data to create social and economic value safely. Thank you.